At the beginning of the 20th century, the words corporate responsibility applied only to the internal affairs of companies. George M. Verity thought differently. To him, any company had responsibilities and privileges of good citizenship, like any resident of the community. He believed that a company cannot hope to survive, let alone prosper, unless it serves the broad purposes of society. Shortly after the Central Works was up and running, Verity moved his growing family to Middletown into the old Gunkel House at 230 South Main Street. His children, Calvin, Leah, and Sarah, were enrolled in the huge twin-towered South School half a block away, and the family settled into life in a small town. Verity soon realized, however, that the town had some problems. Middletown had grown steadily since the Miami and Erie Canal was begun in 1825. The industrial base increased dramatically with the digging of the hydraulic canal in 1852. Its water had powered paper mills, sawmills, flour mills, and machine shops. By 1901, Middletown industry included seven paper companies, two tobacco companies, two buggy companies, a bicycle manufacturing company, and the new American Rolling Mill Company. Paul J. Sorg had been responsible for much of this industrial growth, as well as the cultural growth of the community. In 1891, Sorg built the Opera House to seat 1,500 and provided first-class entertainment. A decade later, Sorg was United States Congressman, but within a year, he would be gone, and new leadership would be needed. George M. Verity was there at the right time. As the industry of Middletown grew steadily, so did the population. In 1900, there were 10,000 citizens. The city had expanded its limits and housing was adequate, but the educational system had been ignored. There were two schools and they were overcrowded, underfinanced, and understaffed. Verity could afford to send his children to private schools, but what about the children of his employees and other citizens? He decided to set an example of mutual interest in the community by getting involved and accepted membership on the local school board. Armco employees were encouraged to get involved also, and they did. By 1909, Verity faced a new dilemma, expansion. While positive for the American Rolling Mill Company, expansion might mean a 30% increase in population, those citizens all needing housing, education, and services. Verity challenged city leaders to share the resultant responsibility if you care to reap the reward. Out of that challenge came a program for Greater Middletown that led to a public library, a modern hospital, new parks and playgrounds, a YMCA and YWCA, and an expanded school system. At first, there were complaints about the company trying to take over and run the town, but as buildings started to go up and programs began, the grumbling stopped and a sense of civic pride took over. Armco's home was secured in Middletown and the city felt it could accomplish anything. Soon, both were put to the test by a natural disaster, the Great Flood of 1913. An early spring thaw and days of steady rain sent waters over the banks of the Great Miami River and into the streets of the city. By March 25th, the water level reached six feet downtown and people scurried east to higher ground. On Curtis Street, Armco was dealing with another problem. That morning, all four furnaces contained molten metal. If the steadily rising water reached them, the result would be a tremendous explosion and devastating damage. Quickly, barriers were thrown up around the furnaces, but the water had reached the lower chambers and it was now boiling hot and still rising. Huge blasts of steam rose from the plant and oil fires broke out. 
but the men worked frantically to save the plant, and by nightfall they had succeeded. Four days later, the water had subsided, and the damage could be viewed. All four furnaces had been damaged, everything was covered in mud, and there was an awful stench in the air. The city was now faced with the threat of an epidemic of disease as the water supply was polluted. But slowly citizens began pulling together to clean up the mess. Armco made railroad dump cars available to run right down Main Street on the traction car line where they were filled with debris and hauled off. The company brought in food, clothing and medicine to makeshift shelters. Pumps were provided to clean out basements and wells. Old prejudices were set aside in the spirit of the moment, and the rebuilding began. Middletown and Armco had survived the local crisis, but soon the country faced one of world proportions. July 28, 1914, Austrian Archduke Ferdinand and his wife were assassinated by a Serbian nationalist, and the peaceful relations of the countries in Europe began to fall like dominoes, one by one. In a few days, almost all of Europe was at war, the First World War. America stayed neutral as President Wilson called on citizens to be neutral in fact as well as in name, impartial in thought as in deed. But this was not easy. An American now made up of citizens from all over the world, the melting pot as it was called, loyalties were divided and bitterness increased. The lyrics of a popular song of the day called Don't Bite the Hand That's Feeding You stated, if you don't like your Uncle Sammy, then go back to your home over the sea. Matters were made worse when a pre-war depression practically brought American business to a standstill. In Middletown, Armco barely held on with just one turn working every day. But on October 15th, 1915, the first war order came in. One million three-inch shells. Then, an order for 100,000 pounds of shrapnel shell forgings. Then more and more. On May 7, 1915, the British passenger ship Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat in neutral waters. Over 1,000 passengers drowned, including over 100 Americans. Neutrality began to crumble, and the country began to prepare for the inevitable. It came on April 7, 1917, when war was declared on Germany, and two months later, American troops were in the fight. The contributions by Armco to the war efforts went well beyond the production of war machinery and weaponry. While tonnage figures almost doubled, Armco men and women subscribed to over $2 million in Liberty Loans and over $74,000 to Red Cross. Nearly 700 Armco men entered the service and 12 gave their lives for the struggle. But Armco's most unique contribution was the Armco Ambulance Corps. Soon after America's entrance into World War I, a few Armco men came up with the idea of a volunteer ambulance corps to help while the country was preparing for war. Fifteen volunteers were chosen with Newman E. Ebersole as leader. The expenses of the unit, including uniforms, equipment, and seven Fiat ambulances, were completely funded by Armco. The Corps was signed up to serve with the Norton Harriet's Volunteer Ambulance Service, and on August 1st, they left Middletown by train to New York, where on the 7th, 
they boarded the French line steamer La Touraine for passage to Bordeaux. The Armco Ambulance Corps served with distinction through many major battles, including the Second Battle at the Marne. After the armistice on November 11, 1918, the unit was awarded the second grade of the French Military Medal, the Fourguerre, and only American unit to receive the honor. On May 3, 1919, the Corps was welcomed home in Middletown with a large celebration where the men were honored for their embodiment of something George M. Verdi called the Armco Spirit, an exemplification of the highest standard of real American citizenship. spirit was one part of a larger group of ideals and practices that had guided George M. Verdi from the beginning. In 1919 he was encouraged to put them into a more formal document that became known as Armco Policies. The adoption of such democratic business practices by the board of directors was innovative in the world of business at that time but the company had long proven its commitment to employees through decent wages, incentives, and safety, and Armco policies would guide the company for many decades. Another Armco innovation was the gradual adoption of the three-shift day as early as 1913. Steel workers had long been used to 12-hour or longer shifts, sometimes seven days a week but long continuous hours on the job only reduced quality and safety. Under then Superintendent Charles Hook, the experiment was implemented in full partnership with the employees and then studies by George M. Verity's son Calvin to understand its impact. Quality, safety, and production increased dramatically. By 1923, the Armco three-shift day plan was being studied by the steel industry and eventually adopted. That year, the steel industry was taking notice of another Armco innovation. Since he walked into George M. Verity's office in the summer of 1904 looking for a job, John B. Titus had been quietly learning the business of making steel. The Middletown native with a degree from Yale started at the bottom as a spare hand, gradually working through all the jobs associated with rolling steel sheets by hand. The young man was struck by the extraordinary amount of effort involved in the process and began to imagine a better way. By the end of 1905, Titus had become Superintendent Charles Hook's first assistant in 1906, he was promoted to superintendent at the Zanesville Mill. In 1909, Charles Hook summoned Titus back to Middletown to supervise the installation of the hand-fed sheet mills at the new East Works. The two men began discussing the feasibility of rolling sheets continuously through stands of mills instead of a single sheet at a time through a single stand. Experiments with the idea had been tried, but they had proved too expensive and very difficult. After the Great War, John Titus was encouraged to try some experiments with the process, and his opportunity came in 1921 when Armco acquired the Ashland Iron and Mining Company in Ashland, Kentucky. The company consisted of two blast furnaces, six open hearth furnaces, a blooming mill, a slab, billet, and bar mill, but no finishing mill. John Titus finally had his laboratory and a commitment of men and resources. Three years later, after countless breakdowns and endless experiments, the mill was rolling about 40,000 tons of quality steel sheets a month.
the new rolling process revolutionized the steel industry. Armco shared its success with its competitors by granting licenses for the use of patents they had developed. By 1929, the demand for specialty steel sheets for the booming auto industry had all the major steel companies investing millions in continuous wide strip mills. Armco's spirit of innovation was not limited to products and policies. With the success of Armco Ingot Iron, found in many products found in the home, the company began to investigate the feasibility of advertising directly to the public. On August the 8th, 1914, the first National Armco advertisement appeared in the Saturday Evening Post consumer magazine. The ad was part of a whole campaign to create awareness and demand for Armco ingot iron, and it worked brilliantly. Soon manufacturers and dealers of household appliances were advertising that their products were made of rust-resisting Armco ingot iron. Armco was communicating with the nation's consumers and that same year it began to communicate with its employees. In April 1914 the Armco Bulletin was launched to facilitate an interchange of thought and suggestion and to create a better understanding of the activities and problems of employees. The first issue was only eight pages, but it was immediately popular with everyone. And by the end of the year, it had expanded to 40 pages, filled with articles and photographs covering a range of company activities. Here, an employee could read words of inspiration from the company founder, or check the team standings in the sports leagues, or be reminded about safety and the hazards of drink. During the Great War, readers were given monthly updates on the activities of Armco men in uniform and reminded them of their duties on the home front. On a lighter note, readers could view recent additions to the Armco family, be entertained with a poem by Frank Fannin, or participate in a contest for the best suggestion or the best original song. At the outset of World War I in 1914, the glut of foreign labor came to an end, and a great migration of African Americans and Appalachian Hill people from Kentucky and Tennessee began. Armco recognized the need for housing and education. Booker T. Washington School was built and presented to the Middletown Board of Education. Housing tracts were built in Middletown and Ashland for the increasing population. After the war, George M. Verity once again challenged the city to increase its efforts to improve the quality of life. He suggested to the Chamber of Commerce that the community be generously unselfish in order to be efficiently selfish. He proposed the community of 30,000 citizens raise one million dollars for civic improvements. After their initial shock, the chamber took up the challenge and within 30 days the million dollars was pledged and the funds were invested and then allocated for major projects. The Chamber of Commerce became the Middletown Civic Association, and their activities were greatly expanded to include the operation of a fresh air camp for underprivileged children, the maintenance of Camp Hook, a large Boy Scout camp, the distribution of city and state welfare funds, and the allocation of funds to Garfield Mission, the Salvation Army, the Middletown Hospital, and the YMCA. Meanwhile, Armco was involved in another civic project. Armco Park. The company purchased a 400-acre tract of woodland east of town, and it was gradually transformed into a public playground for Middletown. Roads were built, picnic sites were developed, trails were cut, and shelter houses were built. In the center was Wildwood Camp, with a dining hall, a recreation hall, 
and a swimming pool. Wildwood Camp was used by the Armco Girls for overnight retreats. The Armco Girls Association had been organized with 100 members in 1919 as a unit of the Armco Men's Association, but later became an independent organization. The group held lawn fates at Armco Field, stage productions at the Armco Theater, and later sponsored a popular jamboree every year. When Wildwood Camp was destroyed by fire, George M. Verity saw to it that the group had a new headquarters in Armco Park called Holiday House. Bunny Hollow was a special place just for young children, and there was a 20-acre bird and small game sanctuary. Adjacent to the park was Wildwood Community Golf Club, which operated an 18-hole course. Thousands of people visited the park facilities every summer to relax, play, and be entertained by the Armco Band, another company gift to the community. On September 25, 1920, over 20,000 people gathered at Armco Field to help celebrate National Armco Day. Employees and families from the Zanesville and Columbus plants also came to Middletown to participate in the festivities which included racing, boxing matches, baseball, and music. After an appearance by the Zanesville Band, Armco officials decided that Armco needed a band in Middletown. They hired the services of a native son who had just finished a tour as solo cornetist with the John Philip Sousa Band. Frank Simon worked hard with the small 25 employee band and they presented their first concert in the Armco Theater on January 7, 1921 after only five rehearsals. That spring, the band, now with 50 members, outfitted in new uniforms, led a huge parade down Curtis Street back to Armco Field to kick off opening day of the Armco baseball season. 5,000 people listened as the band played the national anthem and George M. Verdi gave a talk on the value of athletics to Armco. The band began a series of regular summer concerts and the following year, Simon organized an Armco symphony orchestra and chorus. Middletown was alive with music and the Armco band was becoming a musical institution. The stock market crashed on October 29, 1929, setting off America's most devastating financial depression. Armco was prospering. After the success of John Titus's experiment, the company was expanding its operation. In 1927, Armco acquired the Columbia Steel Company with plants in Butler, Pennsylvania, and Elyria, Ohio. After extensive changes were made, Armco was now capable of producing a million tons of finished products a year. Next, the company moved its blast furnace operation from Columbus, Ohio to New Miami, near Hamilton, south of the Middletown Works. A new railroad line between the two plants was built to accommodate special thermos bottle railroad cars to transport 300 tons of molten iron from the blast furnace to the open hearth furnace 12 miles north without losing heat. Then in 1930, as the country began to move toward massive unemployment, Armco made its boldest move toward expansion by merging with Sheffield Steel Company in Kansas City. Sheffield provided bolts, nuts, fencing, barbed wire, nails, and more to the railroad, construction, oil, and farm industries. As the Great Depression got greater, Armco struggled, sometimes on the verge of financial collapse. But still, the company continued to grow through international markets. By 1935, 
Sales and production had risen beyond the previous record set in 1929. Armco products were everywhere, and their benefits were now being promoted in the popular medium of radio. During the 1920s, the Armco band under Frank Simon had developed into an accomplished musical organization, performing regularly at Armco Field in the new band shell, at Armco Park, and traveling to other Armco plants in Ohio, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. In 1929, the Middletown Sunday News Journal wrote, as the band enters its ninth season with the finest personnel and best playing conditions in its history, it finds Middletown more receptive than ever before. Despite its popularity, the band was also feeling the effects of the Depression as Armco began to lay off employees, including band members. Frank Simon approached Armco Vice President Bennett Chapel with a public relations idea to boost morale and promote Armco products and the Armco name. The company agreed to sponsor a new Armco band of professional musicians on a series of national radio broadcasts over station WLW from Cincinnati. The 30-minute Iron Master program featured stirring band music and Bennett Chapel as the Iron Master delivering a short commercial message promoting Armco Steel products in the home. Another Armco experiment paid off as the show was an immediate success and Armco became a household name. Soon, Middletown was on the national musical map when members of the newly formed American Band Masters Association held their first convention in Middletown at the Manchester Hotel. In 1930, at age 65, George M. Verity was ready to hand over the company reins to a younger generation. He didn't hand them far, however, as son-in-law Charles Hook was named the new president and Verity was moved to chairman. During the next decade, the company continued its steady growth under Charles Hook, developing new products, multi-plate for road culverts, steel housing, highway guardrail, spiral welded pipe, enameling iron, zinc grip, and aluminized steel. Armco was now producing the first stainless steel sheets processed by the continuous coal reduction method at Butler Works. Many of these new products and processes had been developed with the help of Armco's research department where things were really shaking up. On December 25, 1935, there was a gas explosion at the Armco research building and it was reduced to a pile of rubbish. Miraculously, no one was injured and plans were immediately set in place to build a new state-of-the-art facility. Two years later, at the dedication ceremonies, General Motors Vice President, inventor, and Dayton native Charles F. Kettering commented, it is a breath of romance to smell a new research laboratory. On a beautiful spring day in 1936, Middletown hosted a tribute to the man who had led the community to new heights in the early 20th century, George M. Verity. An estimated 25,000 people, representing all the Armco communities, turned out to follow a big parade down Central Avenue to Sunset Park for the Verity Day ceremonies. There, former Ohio Governor James M. Cox remarked to the large crowd, no romance is comparable to the romance of business. Analyze every successful enterprise and you will find behind it all a commanding general who dreamed dreams, whose dreams came true, who built the blueprints upon which the future was buttressed. That evening, while Mr. and Mrs. Verity were honored at a dinner in the Manchester Hotel, the large crowd moved to Armco Field for entertainment 
games, and fireworks. Two years later, Verity was honored again when Verity Parkway was dedicated. The three and a half mile boulevard had been the route of the Miami Erie Canal through Middletown. Since the official abandonment of the canal in 1929, work had progressed slowly to remove the many bridges and fill in the canal bed. The project eventually became part of FDR's New Deal work programs for recovery during the Depression years. While George M. Verity was receiving the community tributes he deserved, Charles R. Hook was filling the role of leadership at Armco and in the community. Hook was respected for his support of Armco Innovations and pioneering efforts in the areas of employee relations and safety. As early as 1910, Hook had organized plant safety committees overseeing safety contests between plants. So successful was the plan that two years later, Hook was invited to give a report to the Iron and Steel Electrical Engineers meeting, the world's first safety congress, and the origin of the National Safety Council. Armco's pioneering efforts led to the company being the first in the iron and steel industry qualified to ensure its employees under a group policy. In 1925, the Middletown Central Safety Committee suggested a safety contest be initiated between the Armco plants. Interplant sports competitions had been very popular for many years, and it was thought that safety records would increase with the added incentive of a contest. After general management approved the plan, the rules were drawn up, and artist Clements J. Barnhorn of Cincinnati was commissioned to create an appropriate trophy to be awarded each year. The Armco Iron Man Safety Award was first won by the Blooming and Bar Department Group No. 3, Ashland Division. Charles Hook's efforts devoted to the human side of industry were starting to receive national attention as he spoke to business meetings around the country. His message was the same one he and George M. Verity had been preaching since Armco began. Above all things, I urge the adoption of plans to bring about a clear understanding of mutual problems and responsibilities at both the shop and the office. In 1938, Hook was elected president of the National Association of Management, the most important management group in industry, and he became the chief spokesman for industry in Washington. In Europe, old feelings of bitterness and aggression were stirring up again in the 1930s. Adolf Hitler was moving Germany toward dictatorship and war. The U.S. was keenly aware that it could be drawn into another world war. In his new governmental role, Charles Hook initiated the preparation of a detailed, complete master plan to allow industry to convert to either full-scale defense preparation or war status, quickly. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the United States declared war, and Hook's plan helped the country mobilize. Next, Charles Hook was sent to England in August 1942 to help the British increase their steel production. The mission was called an outstanding public service. His public service on a national level was just beginning. Charlie, as he was called by mill workers and millionaires, would serve two more U.S. presidents and an ex-president. Throughout his life, he was no less involved with his own community, seeing Armco and Middletown as community partners. In approaching any new challenge, he would ask, is it good for Middletown? On the morning of November 6th, 1942, Middletown lost its leading citizen when George M. Verity died at his home. The tributes poured in, and the city turned out to honor the man who had called Middletown the city with a soul. Verity was actively involved in community affairs right up to the end, working to strengthen the Red Cross for the future 
and expressing concerns with plans for taking care of Middletown veterans returning from military service. For all his accomplishments in industry and business, George M. Verity is most remembered in Middletown for his civic leadership and involvement. He was generous with his time and money, but challenged others in the community to get involved and do their part. His Armco spirit became Middletown spirit, lasting for generations. During World War II, Armco was rewarded for their war production effort with the much prized Army and Navy E Award in 1942, 1944, and 1945. Armco steel was again used in cartridge cases and boat shafts, and an old hand mill was restored to make special taper rolled alloy steel for airplane propeller blades. During those years, the company expanded its western operations with the construction of a steel plant in Houston, Texas. The facility was built alongside the busy Houston ship channel and the first open hearth heat of steel on Texas soil was tapped on April 24, 1942. Armco also consolidated its drainage and building products activities as Armco Drainage and Metal Products Incorporated and acquired the Rustless Iron and Steel Corporation in Baltimore, Maryland, which produced stainless steel products. In 1948, the American Rolling Mill Company welcomed a new president and a new name. Middletown native Weber W. Sebold joined the company as an office boy in 1906 before finishing high school. A few months later, he replaced the company's only salesman. He was so successful at the job that in 1912 he was sent to New York to open a district sales office. By 1926 he was vice president and became executive vice president in 1947. On April 17, 1948, the American Rolling Mill Company officially became Armco Steel Corporation. Under the headline, Millions of People Changed Our Name, an announcement advertisement explained that for years the public had preferred using the advertised trademark name of Armco in referring to the company. Armco began its second half century with a grand celebration. On July the 12th, 1950, the company invited the whole community to a picnic at Sunset Park, complete with rides, entertainment, games, wrestling matches, fireworks, and food. 9,581 pounds of hot dogs, 160,000 bottles of pop, 150,000 ice cream bars, 20,000 boxes of Cracker Jacks, and 150 gallons of mustard. After passing out hundreds of hot dogs with President W.W. Seabolt, Armco Chairman Charles Hook spoke to the crowd about the events at Doty's Grove 50 years before. Two cornerstones were laid that day. The first was the actual cornerstone of the plant. The second was the invisible cornerstone of faith in men upon which our human organization has been built. This was destined to become more enduring than the first. Middletown is the home and the hub of Armco. The spokes reach out to all the free countries of the world. Today, 50 years later, steel making is alive and well in Middletown, Ohio. In the last half century, the company has grown and prospered beyond the imagination of its early pioneers. In the 1960s, Armco launched Project 600, an investment of millions of dollars into improvements at all of the company plants, but mostly in Middletown. By its 75th birthday in 1975, the company had generated record high earnings of $204 million on sales of over $3 billion. C. William Verity, grandson of the founder, was now chairman, having served as sixth president 
from 1965 to 1971. Bill Verity's quiet leadership combined the compassion of his grandfather, George M., the gentle nature of his father, Calvin, and the involvement of his uncle, Charles Hook. At Armco, his door was always open to anyone in the company. In Middletown, he continued the tradition of service to community and with the support of Armco, the arts, social services, government, and business development grew stronger with hundreds of volunteers serving in organizations. In Washington, D.C., Bill Verity served as co-chair of the U.S. USSR Trade and Economic Council, chairman of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and in 1987, he was called out of retirement to serve as Secretary of Commerce under President Reagan. The 1980s were a time of struggle and change for Armco, but the company survived and the steel making mantle was carried on in Middletown by a new company, AK Steel. In September 1999, AK Steel merged with Armco and the long tradition continued. The company has attained unparalleled records in production and safety in the industry. Like its predecessor, AK is actively involved in the betterment of its plant communities. AK Steel is a company that takes bold steps with a vision toward the future, very much like the steel company that took a risk to build a mill in a small town at the turn of the century.